It was a cold and wet Friday afternoon in October. I remember it as though it was yesterday. I was 24 years old. I was driving an eight-ton truck for work. As I entered a busy intersection near a high school, a 15-year-old boy stepped out in front of me. I couldn't stop. At first, I wasn't sure if I hit him. There was no sound. There was no sense of impact from this big truck. But when I felt the back wheels of that truck roll over him, I knew exactly what had happened. Luckily, though, for both of us, he recovered from his injuries. For the last six years, I've been working with a company that's going to make accidents like that almost impossible to happen. That company is seeing machines. And it's incredibly appropriate that we're here today at the ANU campus, because the company was actually a spin-out from this very university some 15 years ago. Today, home to over 200 people, listed on the London Stock Exchange, the company is developing computer vision-based driver monitoring that will come to cars later this year. That means the cars that you buy and that we own very soon will have a very good understanding of you, the driver, in real time. They'll know if you're tired and wake you up if you do have a microsleep. They'll know if you're distracted and alert you if you are. They'll know exactly where you're looking inside the car. And going forward, they'll understand how hard you're concentrating and who you are. Are you allowed to drive this car? When? Where? How fast? I'm sure you've all heard about Google and Uber testing their autonomous cars and driverless taxis in cities all around the world. I'm sure you've heard about how this amazing autonomous technology is going to change our world, make it a better place, greener, safer, more efficient, and how for all of us, we're all going to be so much more productive. But what I don't think you've heard is the truth, the truth about how far this technology is from actually coming to market. To be honest with you, I don't believe that the promises being made in the media or the hype from the companies that still have to raise billions of dollars to bring it to market will really materialize. What I will tell you is why it's so complicated, what's likely to happen. But more importantly, I'm going to talk to you about distracted driving. I'm going to talk to you about the problem that it's become for society. And at the end of this conversation, I'm going to remind you to think twice about using your phone before driving. Driving a car requires virtually all of our visual faculty. And to do it well, most of our mental capacity at the same time. When we text and drive, we take our eyes off the road, on average, for at least five seconds. I'd like you to count that out with me. One, two, three, four, five. Even at only 60 kilometers an hour, we all just traveled more than half the length of a football field. Think of everything that could have happened in front of us while we weren't looking at the road. In the US alone in 2015, there were over 3,400 fatalities due to mobile phone use while driving. Over 390,000 serious injuries due to distracted driving. 390,000 injuries because people are using their phones while driving. Sadly, the largest single demographic involved in those fatalities and accidents and injuries are teenage male drivers, making mobile phone use now the number one killer of the world's teenagers in the US, the UK, Canada, and here in Australia. Now, that's a sad 
and big price to pay for an inopportune glance down, isn't it? The National Highway Safety Administration states that you're four times more likely to have a serious accident if you're using your phone and driving, four times more likely. Yet somehow, we keep doing it. Somehow, I myself am able to convince myself that I'm better than everybody else and that I can multitask while driving. That despite understanding the risk and the consequences, I still do it. I still do it. So there have been a number of advances in driver safety technology for commercial fleets. Today, if you're a long haul driver or drive a mining truck, you might already have a technology in your car, or truck, sorry, that wakes you up when you do have a micro sleep or reminds you to pay attention to the road ahead of you. Those systems are being installed by the fleet owners to protect their assets, their drivers, and their reputations by reducing accidents. Automotive manufacturers, on the other hand, are taking a different approach. They're all striving to introduce higher and higher levels of autonomy over the next decades. The Society of Automotive Engineers categorizes autonomy into six categories, zero through five. A zero car, very common today, would have some sort of sensor that alerts you to something. Think of a reversing sensor that would beep if you, before you backed into something. From there, sensors that provide higher fidelity signals that are actionable by the car so that the car can intervene for you. Common ones today are adaptive cruise control that keeps your car at constant distance from the car in front of you on the highway. Or more interesting, collision avoidance, where they've fused a camera and a radar system to detect slowing or stopped objects in front of you and to put the brakes on for you before you run into that object. Next, hands off wheel. So legally being able to take your hands off the steering wheel on certain types of roads. The first car is available in the market today. Widely accepted, very popular. Yet, that company has failed to provide a safety backup system. You can actually get out of the front seat of the car and let it drive by itself. There's been a number of accidents, some serious injuries. From there, we go to eyes off-road. The first eyes off-road car is just around the corner, available later this year. Then it's mind off driving. For that to happen, these sensor packages have to be incredibly reliable. And then ultimately, level five, the autonomous car. One that would allow you to drive, steering wheel optional. Now all of these technologies form something that's called ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And it's the fastest growing sec uh, I guess supply uh, area within automotive. And if you're an engineer, the hottest market right now. So level four cars, manufacturers expect them to come to market in the next five to 10 years. These cars will have incredibly powerful sensing and data processing platforms. They'll understand a lot about you, the driver, but there are challenges. Nobody yet understands the handover from that vehicle back to the driver. Today, if you're using cruise control, you simply tap, tap a lever, tap a pedal, and you're driving again. Now cast your mind forward 10 years. You're reaching the end of a long journey on a highway. You've been in, enjoying a movie or reading a book. And all of a sudden, you're alerted by a chime that you're getting closer to your destination. You look up. What lane are you in? How fast are you going? How much traffic is there around you? Is it safe to change lanes? How much time to my off-ramp? What am I going to do at the end of that off-ramp? Where do we even start that process? Very complicated, and we don't know. No one knows for sure when level five cars will arrive. Will arrive. When they do, they'll have an array of cameras that understand you and identify you before you even get to the car. That part of the computer will be like your valet or chauffeur and it'll customize the inside of that car, the mood, the entertainment, the work environment, to the way you want it optimized. We're not going to own these cars. They'll be way too expensive. 
Nobody's even sure who will. Some people feel that the rental car companies will own them. Other analysts think that the, the manufacturers themselves will retain ownership of the fleet. No one knows. Either way, though, it's expected that we're somehow going to either summon a private car or a seat in a shared vehicle, that we're going to use a handheld device to flag that ride or a pre-booking system. We still don't know. There are arguments about these cars, whether there'll be more or fewer cars. It's one school of thought is that these cars will be so optimized, traveling around nonstop, not parking, never sleeping, and picking people up, dropping people off. There'll be fewer of them. The other school of thought is that there'll be more cars, that families will split up and go their separate ways, a classic Saturday morning. Three kids go off in three separate cars to sports. Dad goes golfing. Mom goes shopping. Now the family is using five cars. People will use cars much later in life. Older people will continue, continue driving. Well, I don't, guess we can't call it driving, but will continue using cars much, much longer. Children will be put into cars at a younger age, so creating more cars. No one knows for sure. There are challenges, though. Building a level five car is incredibly complex. Some people feel that that last 10% is almost unsolvable. Think of autopilot in an airplane. The technology has been around for over 30 years. The aircraft itself has multiple levels of redundancy built into it. And the authorities dictate that we have a trained, professional, qualified pilot in the seat at all times, even though it has that security. And arguably, you have 30 to 40,000 feet to fix the problem before you bump into anything hard. <laughs> now think about cars. Anybody can get a driver's license, almost. There's no redundancy. And we count on a 10 centimeter wide painted line on a road to stop us from bumping into each other. I honestly believe that the car that we can summon at any time to pick us up anywhere and take us to anywhere is a long way away, if ever arriving at all. I believe that the technology that will be developed for these level two, three, and four cars will force people to review the true requirements for level five. I believe that the advanced collision detection and avoidance systems will reduce accidents, even those of fatigue and distraction. I believe that there are people that like to drive and want to drive. I think that even if we overcome the technical challenges, nobody's talking about the social or economic challenges yet. Think about what happens to our truck drivers, taxi drivers, fleet drivers. Are they all out of work? What about panel beaters, glass fitters, the automotive insurance industry? These cars can't crash. They're no longer required. What about the parking industry? There's even talk of a drop in property values in major cities around the world because all of these parking lots and parking garages become completely redundant. The social challenges. Let's look at the United States, for example. There are states where it's still optional to wear a seatbelt. There are states where it's optional to wear a motorcycle helmet. We all know that we can't take away their guns. Yet somehow, we're going to take away their muscle cars and pickup trucks. I'm not sure. At the beginning of this conversation, I told you I was going to remind you about distracted driving. At any point in time in the US, during daylight hours, there are 660,000 people driving and using their phone. 660,000 people right now, somewhere in the US as we speak, are driving and using their phone. I understand how connected our lives are through technology. I understand how busy we've become and how technology is helping us. But the key word is lives. And I ask you that you don't use your phone while driving so that you can make it home to your family and friends safely.